On this Still Serving, we take a look into the life of Army Captain Jaspin Booth and her fight through multiple personal tragedies which inspired her to help her sisters in need. The hardest part was reaching out for supportive services and, and finding out that America had forgotten about the women. They had forgotten about our service and sacrifice and they had forgotten about my sisters who had fought, bled, and died alongside our brothers. I was a Marine. I defended our embassy in Iraq. I was in the Army. I was a combat photographer in Somalia. We did a lot of good over there. I saw a fellow soldier save the life of a child. That's why I'm still serving. And that's why I'm still serving. These are the stories of true American heroes, of men and women who served in the U.S. Armed Forces, veterans now, still serving their fellow Americans. I joined the Army 13 years ago, and I joined because I wanted to have a tradition of service for my family. I came in as a specialist because I already had a degree. I had just finished college, but after completing basic training in AIT, I decided to go into ROTC and become an officer. I think when you get in, the time just keeps going. Um, when I got in, I didn't say, well, I'm gonna do one tour, I'm gonna do three or four years. It's just, just kept going and the, the years just added up, but I didn't never just said I was gonna make a career out of it. I never said I was gonna do one tour. It just, time just kept compiling and, you know, before I knew it, 13 years had passed. Born and raised in and out of the Cabrini Green Projects in Chicago, Jaspin Booth was headed in the right direction when she joined the Army in 2000. A single mother, Jaspin was looking to start a legacy for her and her son, and spent her first five years in the Army training to become a leader. Then in 2005, Jaspin Booth had arguably the hardest year of her life. I was right in the middle that was totally devastated, I mean, underwater. Um, I don't think until about two or three months after the fact, when the water finally went down, that they were able to go and um, the insurance people to go and assess my things and, and write it off as a total loss. A New Orleans resident at the time, Jasmine Booth lost everything when Hurricane Katrina devastated the city. Still, after losing everything, Jaspin viewed herself as one of the lucky ones. A lot of people, a lot of people lost out and, you know, some, you know, lost family members. And so, you know, things are replaceable, but I am glad that, you know, me and my son were not there at the time and, and our lives were not threatened. I needed to focus on the mission to Iraq. Um, most of my soldiers were in their early 20s and all of their parents had said, bring my son or daughter back safe. You know, there was nothing I could do about what was lost in the storm. I couldn't go back there, couldn't salvage anything. So what I needed to do was just focus on the mission and maintain strong for the soldiers who were looking up to me for leadership. But Jaspin would never make it to Iraq. I was a month out from shipping when I got diagnosed with cancer. So I had trained up, I was ready to go and right at the point we were about to load up is when I received the diagnosis. Um, so I had trained with my platoon, we had become a family, and then I had to break off and leave them. I think we had got to the point where we had done the, you know, storming, forming, norming phase, and we had finally, you know, gotten to know each other, and we were pretty much good to go, and we worked together well as a team. And so they, they lost their leader, I mean, everybody's replaceable, but you know, I just felt like I, I did let them down, even though the situation was out of my control. But you know, they, they were all my, my little kids. <laughs> Shortly after Katrina, Jaspin's cancer diagnosis had her shifting her focus from one fight to another. 
first thing that happened is I had to call my aunt who was taking care of my son at the time. And um, that was one of the hardest phone calls I had to make because my son and I were, you know, we were just always showing at the hip being a, being a single mother. And so I let my auntie know what was going on, but I told her not to tell my son, just tell him I'm still training and doing army stuff because I, I didn't want him to get worried or definitely worry about his mom. I just wanted him to be a happy little boy and I needed to fight this battle on my own. In February 2006, after six months of treatment, 30 cycles of radiation and two surgeries, Jasmine Booth finally received the news her cancer had gone into remission. In my mind, I never had cancer in the first place because I was, you know, <laughs> um, I can't have cancer. I'm a perfectly healthy person. So I had always been in denial. Um, but I was definitely happy because I knew that um, my son would still have his mother. So he still have a parent that could love him and take care of him. You know, that was my, my, my whole thing. You have to get better for Brandon. You can't leave him here on this earth alone. So once they told me that the cancer was gone and I could, you know, start to rehabilitate back into life, he's the first person that I wanted to see. After beating cancer, Jaspin still found herself in a tough place trying to pick up the pieces of her life. At the time, I was a reservist. So eventually I was going to have to come off of active duty, but there were two issues. I had no job and I had nowhere to live. And so that's when I reached out to look for supportive services for women veterans and pretty much found out that there were none. So from there, um, I still have a son to take care of. So I just had to find jobs and resources on my own. The hardest part was reaching out for supportive services and, and finding out that America had forgotten about the women. They had forgotten about our service and sacrifice and they had forgotten about my sisters who had fought, bled, and died alongside our brothers. Probably being a soldier helped me to be resilient and helped me to not, you know, accept defeat or get down. And definitely being a mother, having someone that was depending on me um, drove me to just, just keep looking and, and, and climbing until I could find, you know, a good place for me to be in. Jaspin quickly ran into problems looking for a place for her and her son to stay, with the majority of homeless programs focused on male veterans at the time. I think the main issue was uh, the housing resources were for male veterans, the programs were for male veterans. And they do have some programs that are now saying, well, we'll take in women as well, but you can't put pink paint on a blue program. If the, the program wasn't made for women veterans from the ground up, then it's not for women veterans. I understand people's willingness to help but you have to be able to suit the unique needs of women veterans. And if you are serving women, you need to be able to serve children. So there are most centers that don't take in children, they take a certain number of children. If you have three, don't only take two, what do you do with the third kid? Guess you should have been a better child this year? I don't know how you <laughs> pick between children. But the systems are just not set up to take care of the women and the women with children. Over half our population are single mothers. You know, we've already deployed and been separated from our children. We shouldn't have to come back and face it on American soil. I fought the American people, um, basically because the uniform that I wear says U.S. Army. It doesn't say VA Army. You know, the VA didn't get us into Iraq. They don't have the power to declare war. Congress does. And, you know, when every other country has a major disaster, when their women and children are displaced, you know, we are the first. And I'm not talking about government funding. We're the first to come out of our, come out of our pockets as Americans and text to donate to take care of everybody else's women and children. But when you say, oh, there are 55,000 homeless female veterans and children on American soil, the Americans go, well, the VA should do something about that. That I have a problem with. Jaspin relocated to Missouri to live with her aunt until she finally found a job. Once she was back on her feet, she felt it was her responsibility to help fellow soldiers who may be experiencing the same problems she had encountered. So she founded Final Salute, Inc. I just got tired of people saying this person should do something about that or that person should do something about that. You know, as a soldier, I, I took an oath to never leave a fallen comrade. And that includes, you know, my, my brothers and sisters who are falling on hard times. And so whether they're in uniform or out of uniform, that oath and that commitment still stands. So. I just decided that, okay, well, I'm going to be that somebody that needs to do something about it because these are my sisters and I've been there. 
Final Salute, Inc. is a nonprofit dedicated to helping homeless women veterans get back on their feet and find financial stability. Our, our mission is to provide safe and suitable housing for homeless female veteran and their children. And what I mean by safe and suitable is what I live there. Um, most people come here and they're like, this is the house they live in. And I'm like, yeah, you know, they, they deserve to, you know, have a, have a higher echelon of support in living in a house, that, house that's fit for a queen in return for their service and sacrifice. Caroline Smith is one of those veterans. After falling on hard times, she reached out to Jaspin and found solace in one of Final Salute's homes. I didn't even think anything like this existed, in all honesty. Not at the level uh, that it does. I mean, Jazz does a phenomenal job and all the people that support the program. Um, it's just something I've never seen before. Um, so I've been able to, when I was able to come here, it was gave me a relief from life. You know, trying to pay my bills and get everything taken care of and still trying to look for a job every day and every day the door was closed just feeling like oh my goodness you know I need to breathe so when I came here uh, being able to get you know sit down talk with Jazz you know get some plan going to hey this is what we're gonna do that helped a lot and just being able to look for a job and not feeling like oh if I don't pay my light bill you know I'm not gonna have lights or I gotta pay half of this to make this happen I was just able to kind of breathe a little bit look for a job and just focus my attention on that. Although housing is the major lacking resource, we also understand that employment is an issue. Counseling may be needed. They may, be, they may need to get um, connected with disability and VA benefits. So we focus on what our core mission is, but however, we partner with organizations such as the Department of Veterans Affairs and other employment agencies. We have you know, women that come out do vision boards so um, we have child care support, transportation, so it, it's basically a program that can fill each of the, of the needs that, um, that they may encounter. But I, I, I like to do it as a community network because the more people that are pulling and helping, the more people that can know about it and the more people that can get involved. With three separate homes, Final Salute has helped over 76 women and children in their times of need. As Final Salute grows, Jaspin has been asked to feature her story on talk shows such as Katie Couric to help spread the word that female veterans need our help. When you ask most organizations that, what do you see yourself doing 20, 30 years down the road? You know, you mostly get uh, a response, you know, well, we want to have 200 or 300 houses by then. Um, if I'm still doing final salute 20, 30 years down the road, America is still getting it wrong. I don't want to continue to put a Band-Aid on America's problems. I would not want to have to exist 20 or 30 years down the road. I would hope that by that time, we have gained knowledge on what the root causes of homelessness are among veterans and have truly um, taken care of it. Now, it's supposed to be done by 2015, so if so, then you know I, I could do something else after 2015. <laughs> but if not, I'll still, be, I'll still be here if my sisters need me. If you or someone you know needs the assistance of Final Salute, you can contact them through their website, www.finalsaluteinc.org.